Uh, so we're doing something a little different today. It's the Faraday effect, uh, but we need a background first, so we're going to start there. So I don't know if you remember, but Newton had this very successful theory of optics uh, where light was corpuscles, which is a disgusting word. And they're little little particles of light. And people were kind of working with this theory a lot in the 17 and 1800s to understand like light. One of the important figures in this whole trying to understand light thing was Malice, who found that these light corpuscles have polarity, which uh, uh, means that light has a direction of polarization. He observed this by looking at light as it was reflected and found that while he expected two images to come out, what you saw was just one image, which means only one part of the light was reflected. And so he was thinking this, this must be polarization. Malice was a French physicist and he received the Rumford Medal for his work in optics. Uh, the Rumford Medal is given to people who do like atmospheric science and optics and light and stuff. He was given this award in 1810 and he died in 1812 at the age of 36, which is just shockingly short. He died after contracting the bubonic plague, recovering, and then catching TB. And like the combination just took him out at the very young age of 36. Uh, this has something to do with Napoleon and Egypt. And I don't know anything about history, but one of the articles I said compared Napoleon to George W. Bush and Egypt to Iraq. So do with that what you will. So from Malice, we learn that light can be polarized. Now he didn't know any of this, but if you think of light as an electromagnetic wave, and you have the electric field bouncing and the magnetic field bouncing orthogonally. And the direction of polarization is in the plane of the electric field. Light can be linear polarized, meaning the electric field bounces like up and down in one direction, or it can be circularly polarized, meaning the electric field kind of goes around, or it can be both. And this is called elliptical polarization. And it's just a, a combination of the two. All of this is true, unless you decide to go look up waveguides, but I don't want you to look up waveguides, not today. That's, it's beyond the scope of this presentation. So you can think of a linearly polarized beam as the superposition of two circularly polarized beams. Like imagine you have one beam going this way and one beam going this way. When you add them together, they would just create one linearly polarized beam. And you can do that same thing to a circularly polarized beam, turn it into a linear polarized beam, like in your brain with math. This will be important for later. With everything in physics, the way you observe a light's polarization will depend on your frame of reference, is what I'm saying. So there's a really common physics demo that highlights this property of waves. And I found this great video of Sir Lawrence Bragg, the original physics Nepo baby. And he did all of these Christmas lectures for the Royal Institute, just demonstrating electromagnetic forces and sound waves and all these cool little experiments. So I will link the video below. So in the demo, I'm gonna show you though, is he's got radio waves coming through. He's got like a mechanical polarizer that's like of scale. Uh, ju just watch the demo. Polarization. Now this is an interesting effect. We've seen that these electromagnetic waves, the magnetic and the electric fields are at right angles to the way in which the waves are traveling. Uh, in this particular case, this klystron is sending out waves which the electric field is up and down. I can show that by means of this screen here. I'll move this round first of all, so that it picks up the direct beam. And here I've got a screen of conductors. Now, if I place that in such a way that these conductors are parallel to the electrical wave, they kill it, as it were. They, uh, being conductors, a current flows in them to kill the pol electric polarization. So you will see, if I hold this with the rods vertical, it cuts it out. But if I turn it round and hold them horizontal, 
it goes through. Vertical. So because light has this polarization, it has a direction, we can use that to our advantage to like focus light, to filter light using something called a polarizer. Yeah, I don't like that either. A polarizer is, you can think of it, th think of it as like a filter. You have a light, like a white light, it's got random direction, and you put a polarizer here. That light goes through and what comes out is going to be polarized light that depends on the orientation of your polarizer. So if all of your little polarizer arrows were doing this before, after, they're gonna go out like this. And I've talked about polarizing helium on this chain. No. And no, it was helium. It was helium. I've talked about polarizing helium on this channel before. And I mentioned how you had to have rubidium and you would shine a laser that would excite the rubidium and shoot off photon and that photon would hit the helium and it would make it polarized uh, because the initial beam was circularly polarized, which I didn't explain in that video, I don't think. And I said you had to keep this pumping laser going or otherwise your helium would just collide with each other and just lose its polarization and go back to random through like collisions because those are particles. Electromagnetic waves are not like that. If you have a laser beam and you hit it with a polarizer and the light comes out polarized, it's just gonna hang out like that until it's like absorbed and emitted by something. Something else you can do with polarizers is of course, like you have your light coming in, you put one polarizer like oriented this way so all the light coming out will go like this. Is that what I want to say? Yeah, let's let's choose that notation. So you orient your polarizer this way, so all the light coming out goes like this. So if you take a second polarizer here and you turn it this way, all your light going through like this is going to be like reflected or extinguished by the polarizer and no beam will come out. Uh, a fun quantum mechanics thing called the paradox of three polarizers is to take one polarizer like this so your light comes in and i'm gonna make a cartoon i'm gonna move my hands around like crazy but you won't see that you're gonna see a cartoon so <laughs> your laser light comes in it hits this polarizer all the light going through looks like this 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 and then you take a second polarizer and you do like at an angle and now all the light going through looks like this 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 and then you take your third polarizer and do it at the original way like you just input a new polarizer at a different rotation and because of quantum mechanics the light is no longer distinguished it's just reduced by a factor of eight interesting it's not really a paradox you just you just have to do the math with quantum mechanics um but it's fun the work of malice who didn't get to finish his work because he died tragically young of getting the plague and then tuberculosis yikes was carried on by brewster uh, of Brewster's angle. You've heard of it. So Brewster found that the angle of incidence of the light that allows you to reflect off a specific surface with polarized light is dependent on the index of refraction of the materials. So if you have like a material boundary, like this is air and this is like water or glass or something, the angle of incidence is going to be this angle right here. And that angle that will do a nice little perfect reflection depends on N1 and N2. This is called Brewster's angle. Malice had worked this out for water, but he could never get a good enough sample of glass to do this because glass is really important and it's, it's also really hard to make. And then he died of bubonic plague. So Brewster got glass and he was able to work out this from multiple different types of materials. And he came up with this general formula. So Brewster is a very famous Scottish physicist and he died at the age of 86. So he had a lot of time to work on this comparatively. But Brewster's angle is a very specific case of a series of equations called the Fresnel equation. Fresnel was a French physicist who's like a much bigger deal than I think people realize. While he was alive, people were comparing him to Newton, they were comparing him to Kepler, just the importance of his work in describing how light behaves. And the important thing about Fresnel is that he sided with Huygens? Huygens? Christian Huygens who said that light's a wave, not a particle. Whereas remember, Newton was like corpuscles, particles, disgusting word. Huygens and Fresnel are like, no, this is a wave, we can describe it with wave equations, which of course become incredibly important later when you start doing quantum mechanics, right? So Fresnel, a big giant deal. And he also gets the Rumford medal. He gets this medal for the series of equations that describe exactly how light is transmitted and reflected through a medium 
um, at a boundary, depending on the properties of those mediums. Uh, it's a beautiful theory, great work. He gets the medal and he dies eight days later of a worsening cough at age 37. What is with these French physicists who are like heroes of optics dying so young? How is that happening? It's, it's just, it's weird that it happened twice in the 1800s of, with people working on the same thing. It's odd. It's weird. What, what's going on in France? So this, this brings us to the Faraday effect. In his journals, Faraday writes, I have at last succeeded in magnetizing a ray of light because Faraday for a long time just had a hunch that magnetism and electricity were related. Of course, that's, that's, that's shown with experiments that Faraday himself has done, but it's not written up completely until Maxwell years later. But he thinks this electricity and magnetism is also related via light. Light is related to electricity and magnetism. And he's working on these intense experiments to try to prove that this is the case. So Michael Faraday is a very famous, like top tier physicist. He's like the father of experimental physics. He, he just had this really intense, like, it's so hard to, he deserves his own video, but you can read his journals online where he is like very specifically being like, I am working with heavy glass today. I am taking an electromagnet and I am putting it in like this and shining a laser through and then I rotate it by 90 degrees and then I have a different sample of glass that's like 90% silica whereas that one was 74% silica and I'll see how these change things and he just keeps these huge notes just a huge note taker that guy and it's really really impressive and also like if you think about the time when he was doing this which is the early mid 1800s like imagine the equipment he was using to do this it's amazing and brilliant but let's let's talk about what it is so he wants to show experimentally that light is affected or can affect magnetic and electric fields so faraday's experiment was this he has a beam of light and he puts a little polarizer on it so that the light going through is like polarized like up 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 and then he puts another polarizer right here and it's turned the opposite way. So the light will go through, it will hit the second polarizer and because that light is already polarized in a different direction, the light will be extinguished. And his head is like right here, peeking through a little hole. Great. <laughs> um, in between these two polarizers, he puts a piece of heavy glass, just like a big rod of heavy glass so that the light leaves the first polarizer goes through the glass and enters the second polarizer. And surrounding this whole business is an electromagnet. And what he observes is like, when the electromagnet is off, we have our two polarizers, no light is coming through over here. But when you turn on the electromagnet, a little bit of light comes through. He calls it minuscule, but indistinguishable. He has shown that a magnetic field can change the polarization of light. Because he has these two polarizers here, and he knows that here the light will be extinguished where his eye is, unless he turns on the magnetic field, what must be happening is that inside the glass, the light, the polarization of light is being rotated because of the magnetic field, because it doesn't happen when the magnetic, or when the electromagnet is turned off. He's done it. Let me read you what he says. But when the contrary magnetic poles were on the same side, there was an effect produced on the polarized ray and thus magnetic force and light were proved to have relation to each other. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's wonderful. <laughs> I love to see it. I bet you're wondering what this stuff looked like. Actually, I don't know. I'm super interested in old timey experiments. Like what, what was his source of light? Like what was it? Um, the Bunsen burner wasn't invented until 1855, and Faraday wrote down that he had done this in 1845, so like, was it a candle? Um, anyway, I want to show you this video from this great channel where they specifically set up old-timey experiments, and it's, it's absolutely perfect and wonderful. Uh, this is the Faraday effect.
so that's probably not exactly how Faraday did it. Like I said, they used a Bunsen burner, which wasn't invented until 10 years later. But I mean, surely you had a gas flame somehow, but that's really cool. I think like the tidbit of knowledge everyone has about Faraday is that he's this world-class experimentalist, but he's not really into like making grand theories of things. He's just like, I know that light is related to the electromagnetic field. I just did it. And it wasn't until later, until you know, Maxwell comes along and he like uses Faraday's results to write down a theory of electromagnetism. I'd like to just explain like physically what's happening when you look at the Faraday effect. Like a polarized beam of light goes into a material, a magnetic field surrounding the material is turned on and inside that material, the polarization of the beam is rotated. There's this wonderful figure from Wikipedia that's in 100,000 physics theses around the world. <laughs> the polarized beam goes in to the material, which has a magnetic field around it or through it, or whatever makes the most sense for whatever purpose you're using it for, and out comes a beam that has been rotated. What is happening physically inside that material? Well, like it has to be something with the electrons, right? So remember when I said you could think of a linearly polarized beam of light as a superposition of circularly polarized light with opposite directions, right? So your input light is going into the material, which is in front of me right here. And you can think of it as a superposition of two beams, one going this way and one going this way, right? When you put the magnetic field on the electrons of that material, they will start moving because charged particles will move in a magnetic field. So imagine they all start moving in these little circles. Depending on the orientation of your field, the electrons will all go this way or they'll all go this way, right? So your light coming in is going this way and also this way and the electrons are going one way. This is gonna create an asymmetry in how the magnetic field affects the light, right? One direction of rotation of your superpositioned circularly polarized beam that looks like a linearly polarized beam is going to feel a stronger movement in one direction than the other. This asymmetry causes the light going in like this to go like that, okay? We did it. That's what's happening. If you don't know the relationship from Verde's constant, what parameters do you think affect this polarization? Well, first of all, the magnetic field, right? A stronger magnetic field will wiggle the electrons more, which will create a bigger effect. Uh, you have the length of your material. Because uh, if you look at the Wikipedia picture, you can see that the light is rotating more the longer it's in the material. So if you increase the length of your material, you can change the angle of polarization more. And then of course, it also just like depends on the material. Something like glass versus like tungsten crystal versus like CO2 gas will have a different effect. So Verde, Another French physicist, optics must have been huge in France, who died at age 42. What's going on in France? Verde was born when Faraday was 33, an adult man. And Verde died at age 42, the year before Faraday died, an old man. But Faraday was, was English. So, like, what was going on in France? I actually found, <laughs> I found this chart for the life expectancy in France. And it's at like 40 in the 1800s. But then I compared it to the one from the United Kingdom and I like overlapped them and they're basically the same. So like what was going on specifically with physicists who did optics in France that they all died at 42, but all of the Scottish and English physicists who were working on optics lived until their like late 70s. What's going on there? Is there like a giant history thing I'm just missing? What happened to people who did optics in the 1850s? What happened in France specifically? What's going on there? Faraday, he worked on this and as Faraday did, he moved to all different kinds of things throughout his life, which is just like premium experimental physicists. Just like he's working on glass, he's he's working on heat, he's working on electromagnet. It's amazing. It's fine. It's cool. Faraday 
studied the Faraday effect by looking at a bunch of different materials, and he developed this formula where you can predict the angle of polarization. So the shift in your light, that angle, you can predict it by the Verde constant, which depends on the material, the strength of the magnetic field, and the length of your material. So I know what you're thinking, like, we live inside of a very long material, like we have an atmosphere, and we live on a ball that has a giant magnetic field. So why don't we see this effect all the time. Shouldn't we be seeing the Faraday effect from all sunlight all the time, all the time? Shouldn't we notice this? Shouldn't this have drastic effects on our life? And no, because the Verde constant of air is, is orders and orders of magnitude smaller than something like glass or like tungsten crystal. Like it's teeny tiny. We would never notice this effect in our everyday life. It would be like trying to find skin cancer rates from the light of Alpha Centauri. Like, yeah, that light's hitting us. We can see it, but it's it's not it's not in the first few orders of effects that we're even worried about. But it it took Faraday a while to find it because it's it's very small. It's hard to detect, especially in the 1850s. So uh, here's a table of the Verde constant for a bunch of different materials. Okay, so we did it. We did the Faraday effect. We know how it works. It's amazing. Like, we, we watched Faraday do it. Well, no. So we watched a recreation of 1800s-ish equipment to see it. You get it. And we also learned, like, what properties affect it. Like, you have the length of your material, the magnetic field, and then, like, the material itself will affect how strong this effect is. It's a lot of effects in a sentence. Except the explanation, it's not good. electrons are not spinning around, right? They're not particles on orbits. There's quantum. You, you got to do quantum, quantum, quantum. Like the explanation with our handy little polarized light going into like the electron spinning is just, it's not right. It's, it's a very classical mechanics explanation for a very quantum, quantum, quantum problem. So I'm not going to do the quantum mechanics today. And I've actually never solved a problem like that. And I don't ever want to. to hours later so you could like numerically not analytically solve the schrodinger equation for an electron in a crystal potential uh, and you could calculate the probability of polarization from like interactions and then you could like extrapolate that to like the length of your material and people have done that and professional atomic physicists would like write up a whole little paper where they would be like great the quantum 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 answer took us a year and a half and gives us exactly what Verde's constant gives us like why would you ever do all the quantum when you could measure it so easily like you can just get a material especially in a 2020s lab compared to an 1845 lab and you could just measure the Verde constant and you could just use that info you could just put it in a table um so while the classical explanation of like oh the electrons moving around is not correct it gives the right answer so i think as long as you know that when you're using it it's, it's totally fine. No one's doing the Schrodinger equation unless it's for the hydrogen atom. Um, so we did it. We did it again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it solved. It's fine. <sighs> okay, so I haven't filmed this yet, but I do have, I have a little experimental setup. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to show you the Faraday effect. So... I don't know if that went okay yet or not. Future Angela will splice in that video here. A physics demo. Okay guys, so here's my little experimental setup. I have a red diode lasered here, a polarizer here, and a polarizer here. So the light should come out and you see it there. You see it there. You see it there on the wall. So this is where we're going to be looking at the red dot on the black wall. And like, yeah, white would be better because the black's absorbing some of the light. But I, I just feel like black makes it easier for me to see. 
at least. So here we have a polarizer and here we have a second polarizer. We don't really need this first one because a diode laser is going to put out like really nicely polarized light, but that's fine. We're just, we're making it a nice little experiment. And I should be able to turn this second polarizer in such a way as to block the light. There it goes. Uh, so there, there we've done it. So if we turn it to match the other polarizer, we get like the full intensity out because the polarization of the laser light is not changing between here and here. So if these are set to the same setting, we're going to get like a hundred percent out and that's totally fine. Um, something else to note is that the reflections from this laser are pretty bad. I'm going to turn my camera. Don't judge my books. Do you see that? Do you see that red dot? So um, these polarizers, they have an anti-reflective coating on them, but they're not matched to the laser. So uh, we'll just ignore that for now because we have seen the effect of blocking light via its polarization. So that's great. We want to look, well, we want to block that first. So we want to look at the Faraday effect. So what I have here is a Faraday rotator, which I will talk about later but I'm going to put this in the middle. There we go. Um, inside here is a crystal, which is our material that will allow the magnetic field to, to rotate the polarization of light. And there's already a magnet around here. You see that uh, it's, it's a magnet. It's already, <laughs> oh no. I'm so scared of magnets. It's already doing the thing. It's already doing the thing. So I'm sure I described it or future Angela described it, but this is a Faraday rotator. Um, it's a tiny device that contains a crystal and has a permanent magnet around it. See, I'm so scared of magnets. It has a permanent magnet around it. And this, this does the Faraday effect all wrapped into one. And these are actually really important. The Faraday effect is like this teeny tiny thing where it's like, oh, we can rotate the polarization. But a Faraday rotator is used in like optics. Like you have actually inside here a polarizer, your crystal, your, your, your permanent magnet, and another polarizer. And this works to like prevent back reflections and stuff of light. So if you, I don't know, want to communicate all the data of the world with fiber optics and like light carrying information, you want to make sure what goes in is exactly what goes out and does that for thousands of miles. So these are actually really, really cool. The Faraday effect is this tiny thing that ended up being super important for communication and technology. And that's really interesting. Just like the importance of experimental physics, like photons are the force carriers for the electromagnetic force. And Faraday just had this hunch and then he proved it. And, and, and now we have the internet. So that's cool. So first of all, uh, I definitely didn't break my setup by getting the magnet too close to the Faraday rotator. Dot. Oh no. <laughs> but uh, this is quite a bit later. And <laughs> I actually, like I did show you Faraday rotation by putting in the Faraday rotator, like the light enhanced. Here's a clip of me already doing that. You saw it. There we go. But I just, I don't feel like that's a good enough like demo. Like, yeah, you put in your $600 piece of equipment and it, it changes the rotation. So instead, what I wanna try to do is take a giant magnet <laughs> and change the rotation of this light. So let me describe the setup I currently have. So I have the laser. There's a first polarizer ensuring that this is a polarized beam. Although remember like with lasers like this, like it's pretty polarized already. We don't need to worry about that. Ooh, this is like a shadow. Oh, it's, it's going to be there anyway. That's fine. Okay. And then we have 
the Faraday rotator. So if the light is going in linen like this, it hits the Faraday rotator and by the time it leaves, it's like this. And I have now set this polarizer to filter the rotated light. So the light goes through this, like this, this, it hits the Faraday rotator, it goes like this, and then nothing should go through. And that's how I have it set now. So you can see if I change the direction of this polarizer, this light gets brighter. And this is kind of like the maximum amount I can, oh, it looks so much brighter on camera. This is kind of the maximum amount I can get rid of this light because of all the reflections. Like, can you see this here? I already showed you what's on the back wall. Like this equipment, I mean, maybe I'm just not good at it. <laughs> okay, so I'm actually gonna move the camera closer to this so my hand's not in the way when I move. Well, I still want you to see the magnet. I don't know. Okay, so what you see here, I have mostly extinguished, oh, it's a little bit brighter on camera. You might be able to see one dot or maybe two dots. The bright dot here is a reflection. Like something like this, I'm just, I'm not an experimental physicist. Okay, but the bottom dot is the beam line. I have made this polarizer turn so that it blocks what's coming out of the Faraday rotator. And I'm gonna add this magnet. This magnet will change the magnetic field in this crystal, which will cause the angle of polarization to change, which means this polarizer will no longer filter all the light. So we ignore this bright dot, and hopefully we see a second dot get brighter when I move closer. So there it is. It's gone. There it is. gotta figure out how to zoom in but you can definitely see it that is the Faraday effect this is the best I can do <laughs> we did it we did it yay <laughs> Before I purchased this equipment, sponsor me Thor Labs, I thought that I could just do it with some like little neo, is it neodymium magnets with like a hole cut out and I could just shine a laser through and then I could see the Faraday effect, but it turns out it's like really hard to see. So like I failed, I couldn't do it. I'm just, I'm a stupid theorist who was like, Faraday, the greatest experimental physicist of all time, did this in 1845. Surely I could do it. I could do it right now. Surely I could do it. That's fine. So I'll just play that footage of my failure, just a testament to, to hubris. Uh, an embarrassing garbage theorist tries to do experiment. So thanks for watching. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to try to show the Faraday effect. I have a um, red diode laser and a polarizer and then a second polarizer set up. So you can see the beam here and I've got a bunch of back reflections. I, I'm just going to try to ignore it. I, these have an anti-reflecting coating, but they are like they're polarized, right? So the light hits this and it sends the light of the correct polarization through and the other stuff gets hit back, but it's just hitting my camera. But that's, that's probably fine. Um, you see the beam here, and I can change this polarizer so that it is in extinguished, right? So if the light is going through here, like up, 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 I have this filter set to block up light, something like this, so it doesn't go through. So that's great. So according to the Faraday effect, if we put a medium here, ooh, there it is, with, with a magnetic field going through it, we should be able to change the polarization of light so that we can see something. So I have a magnet. Aha. <laughs> I have a magnet here. So the strongest magnetic field is going to go through. So if we put the beam through the magnet, it should, well, you're seeing reflections maybe. That's just a reflection. That's not rotated light. But if we put the beam <laughs> through the magnet, through an appropriate medium, because the Verde constant of air is teeny, teeny, tiny, we should be able to see um, a fraction of our dot go through here. 
So I have water. Um, water has a much higher Verde constant than air. So put our water here. Great, and this, this glass, glass has a similar Verde constant to air. Oh God, you can see the reflections right there, but you're not seeing anything go through. Um, there you go. So water has a similar Verde constant to glass, so that should be fine. And we should be able to poke the laser beam through the water, through this magnet and see Uh, absolutely nothing. Okay. So the laser's definitely going through. <laughs> oh my god. I think, I think I need a much stronger magnet. The, the magnetic field should be strongest directly through the center. Yeah. Maybe I turn the lights off? <sighs> oh, this is absolutely nothing. So I didn't talk about this in the video, I don't think, but um, the Verde constant is a property of materials, but it's also sensitive to wavelength and temperature. So I also have a green laser. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm honestly, I'm like a little bit scared of using a green laser. Um, so this is just a shitty laser off Amazon and I'm so scared of just reflecting this light into my face and going blind, but let's see without the water. Okay. Well, that should be blocking it. Ooh, this is going to be hard to hold. Let's see. Okay. There it is through the polarizer. Okay. Oh, the beam's much easier to see. Okay, so I've got absolutely nothing and this is a fail and I'm kind of worried about using this green laser because I'm scared of magnets and apparently I'm also scared of lasers. Uh, yeah, this is pretty pathetic. See you later.